Okay. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm Denise and um, Jasmine and Karina are here with me today. Um, we're going to talk to you about, give you a Durham perspective on the language ecology of Sydney. Um, Jasmine. Baju Bujuni Daragu Yiora Yiora Barang Nurago Baju Bujuni Daragu Morungad Barani Yagu Barabagu Yiora Baju Bujuni Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Yiora Nurago Bamo Warami, hello, my name is Jasmine Seymour. I'm a Buddha Barongo woman who belongs to Darug country. I'd like to pay my respects to Darug people, the people who belong to this country where we are broadcasting from today. Um, I speak well of Darug grey hair yesterday, today and tomorrow people. I speak well of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's homes um, and country. So it is wonderful to be here with you today. And as I'm reading this, I mean, it's still looking at it, thinking I'm still learning and there's so much I would change in this acknowledgement of country, even as we're moving forward with the Darug language. And so just want to acknowledge that we are very much learners in this space, but it is wonderful to be able to use our language. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm talking today from um, Ngunnawal country, so I'd like to acknowledge that as well. Um, so um, by way of introduction, we'd just like to um, tell you that we're using the word Darug to mean the whole Sydney language. Um, and um, not as some people do um, use it or that a word sounding like that to mean just one dialect. Um, uh, we are working. So Karina, Jasmine and I are working, we're embarking on an ARC grant with Jane and Carmel and Susan Perch and Sally Dixon. And in that ARC grant, we're looking at language ecologies, particularly inspired by our work for the National Indigenous Languages Report of 2020, where we tried to develop a little bit of a tool that sort of gave policy makers and certain you know, service deliverers um, a guide, a very broad brush guide to some of the language diversity in Australia. And how we did that was we said that in you can you can think about um, a community vernacular um, as being likely to be learned as a first language, and that can be different kinds of languages, and that implies what other languages um, people will be wanting to learn in that um, um, language ecology, so the additional languages. And so on the basis of that, what we're doing today is we're giving you a little bit of a deep dive into that English. Um, uh, uh, language ecology, where people are learning Darug um, as a traditional language. Now, with this language ecology idea, of course, this is um, something quite close to um, Jane's heart, um, and she has described um, many language ecologies um, throughout her career, particularly through the ACLA projects, um, where she was looking um, a lot in remote communities, um, where there was traditional language speaking communities, as well as content language speaking communities. But Jane's also been involved in re revitalization projects and revival projects, such as um, in Adelaide with Gauna, which has got a lot in common. And um, we have been inspired a lot by Rob Amory's work as well in Adelaide on Ghana, um, as we've been thinking about Darug. Um, in our talk today, we thought that we might go back to the roots of this language ecology idea um, um, with the work of the linguist um, on our Haugen. And so we're going to organise our talk on the basis of his 10 questions, which he used as a, as a tool to sort of um, um, help people explore language ecologies. And we're going to do this in a kind of way that um, is I suppose, a dialogue um, between us here. Um, but we don't want you to think that because it's a dialogue, because uh, we want to answer these questions, it'll be in a kind of standard, um, um, standard way, as well as then draw on community and um, lived experiences and the experiences of Jasmine and Karina as languages teachers. But it's not a simple um, binary of um, I don't know, linguist versus community or mm, academic versus community, something like that, because both Jasmine and Karina as Darug um, um, women and teachers of Darug and researchers of um, Darug, they wear many hats. And myself too, I'd sort of say, certainly I've got the languages teacher hat, um, uh, as well as, you know, sort of linguistic kind of hat and many other things. So yeah, anyhow, well, here we go. <laughs> 
Mm. So the first question he had is about classification. And from our collective point of view, um, that's kind of technically useful in a language revival setting um, and in the dialogue um, setting as well. Um, if you have linguistic training and for linguistic work, um, but quite clearly also um, the classification of dialogue has been rethought and con considerably rethought in some ways over the years in terms of the naming of the language and also the areas that it's been ascribed to. And so if you look at this map here, um, you can see that green band going down the eastern coast of New South Wales, which is a bit of the Ewan Koorik family. And we've got some of the Koori family um, subfamily, subgroup, sorry, beg your pardon, <laughs> get my terminology right. Um, and you've got some of the Koori group there um, uh, sort, of, um, sort of listed. And then you can see in the darker brown writing, we've got how Darok is listed with the head word of Eora, and it's together with Dark and Yung there in the middle, 221 and 222 being the Darug. And then we've got Ewan, or at least part of the Ewan family represented there as well. So that's um, if you then sort of fast forward to um, Wafer and Nisarag, who did a study of New South Wales languages, you can see that you have a grouping of Sydney Hawkesbury going to the Sydney language, and then that split into coastal Sydney under the name of Eora and Eora. So whereas a head word here, here it's a dialect, and then um, inland Sydney, so Darug, where it was sort of positioned as a language here, now it's a, a dialect here. So um, you can see that things have changed quite a lot or are constantly changing. Um, and so, um, Jasmine, um, when we spoke about this, um, we thought that, you know, while technically um, all of this is quite useful and we found it so, sociopolitically, we could say that technically it's kind of heart value material because it's so easily misunderstood. And I was wondering if you'd like to say a few words on that. Yeah, absolutely. And it is heart value material. It is very... Um emotional for people who see these words and and to see it change constantly because I think uh, what happens is as you look back you see that everyone who writes about Darug people or the, the Sydney Basin people they rename us and they reclassify us and all the borders change every single time anyone does that it all changes again for us and it's very rarely ever come from us um, from our from our point of view or our perspective and for the people, um, for the people who identify as Darug, you know, you know, our family lines go back to when, you know, at first contact. So we are most definitely the people of place. And Darug is the name that we have chosen to identify ourselves as. And so, um, you know, this is, it can be really contentious and having to fight for your name having to fight for your identity is um, can be really can be really tough and so while the classifications are um, you know very useful they can also be used against us um, and so that is why it is hard attack uh, sort of material as well for us when we look at it yeah Yes, no, thank you so much for sort of explaining that because what we're trying to do here is we're trying to sort of add um, that extra view that perhaps, um, yeah, isn't explicitly stated as you look at, you know, sort of Haugen's questions. And so what we've been doing, everybody, is we've been, as we've been discussing this in all sorts of ways, um, so we've got kind of complex methodology here, um, is that we've been trying to theme, you know, these kind of extra things that might only be implied or might only with certain lenses, such as lived experience, be applied to um, such questions. And so on each slide, we'll sort of pop up the themes that have come up for us, you know, sort of as we've been discussing each of these, um, each of uh, Haugen's questions. Uh, moving on then to users. Um, one of the really important things that just crops up all the time for us, even as um, Jasmine did the acknowledgement at the start of our presentation, is that all users of Darug are learners. And just like in all other language revival settings, but very often that is kind of downplayed would be one of our observations. So anyhow, as we've been discussing this, we sort of grouped users because we felt that there was particular um, characteristics that belong to each you know, of our groupings of users. Um, so there's people identifying as Darug, other Aboriginal people, um, non-Indigenous allies. And also there was users of Darug who didn't know that they were um, users of Darug. So in a kind of way, they weren't learners. That's um, yeah, quite an interesting category too. And so in terms of people identifying as Darug, we found that um, there was Darug people who 
tended to want to become communicative, who had a sort of community orientation for, the, for their learning, but also there was an individual aspect to this around their identity as well. Um, for um, other Aboriginal people, very often it was a matter of respect, they're living on Darug country, and sometimes they had professional or other interests um, that led them to really want to support Darug learning. For example, they might work in school or conservation. There was many Indigenous allies, uh, non-Indigenous allies revolving around often um, school, um, but of all different ages, preschool to university, and maybe um, their teachers, there was language researchers, and then there was people who were just generally supportive um, of community endeavours and had a more um, sort of casual sort of um, interaction with Darwin. And then, and then, um, and then as well as that, we had um, sort of um, place names and um, even in Creole we've got Darug words that sort of traveled um, yeah sort of in early contact languages to the Creole speaking areas. Um, yeah, sorry I'm not sure um, if you were um, Jasmine already. Oh. Hello. Hello sorry yeah. Yes yeah, sorry I'm not sure um, if you were already sort of yeah sort of saying because I can't see you I beg your pardon yeah. Oh if sorry. You, Oh, no, oh, it wasn't me who spoke, but that's, that's, oh, I didn't mean to. Anyway, but you know, <laughs> the users of Darug, I mean, and that is something that Karina and I have really had to work hard at. And, you know, Karina and I are both Masters of Indigenous Language Education um, graduates. And for me, when I went into that course, um, it was a shock to me that I wasn't actually uh, using much language. And so for the community that has been using the language that they have to, to reframe them as learners has been something that Karina and I have worked really hard at through the lessons that we have taught and really modelled from ourselves that we are learners. And like even in the acknowledgement, we are still learning. I am still learning. We learn every single day. I'll be learning my language for the rest of my life. And, and, you know, that's so important to build in these language um, learning communities because, you know, the what fluency is and, and what a whole language is, is, you know, we're not really sure about it, but it's because we've never been taught. No Aboriginal people in Australia have really been taught anything ever about their languages. And so, um, you know, to have that information is just incredible and we have really seen it lift our community so it's really amazing so all these users of Darig we're just we're we're starting to feel really overwhelmed with everyone who wants to learn Darig it is wonderful and I think too also you know those that have gone before us we're standing on their shoulders you know um with respect because there has been quite a bit of work that has been done by by different users um, or by different Darug people mm. and yes yeah, so it's really important to acknowledge that and we all we're doing is we're just growing and learning from yeah that's, that's right and we're really building on everyone's um, mm. work before us and there's that lovely analogy from Tula one of our um, Darug women who who said about Japanese that in their, all of their archives, they write next to it and it's just building the body of knowledge. Mm. And, and so we feel like that's happening with Darug as well. We're just building, constantly building better knowledge about our language. In terms of the domains, everybody, um, again, we really felt that this um, idea of language learning was really um, prime as we discuss um, the Darug language ecology. And so um, that meant that for intentional Darug language learners you know, with each other and with supporters, they had particular domains, um, whereas the other sort of Darug language users and experiences um, as well as those who were intentionally learning Darug, had other sorts of domains. So what we mean by that is that for intentional language learners, it really revolved around um, yeah, language learning context, actually. Um, and sort of that didn't have to be just face-to-face -face or classroom because there's all sorts of language learner groups and uh, also sort of beginning interactional use as well between those um, you know, intentional language learners. But for other people, there was all sorts of other ways that they might use or experience Darug. Jasmine, sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. The, I should so, say over now. I beg your pardon. Yeah, sorry. We've done this when the, we've been the, able to see each other. Sorry. <laughs> oh, and, uh, yeah, so, um, so for lots of learners now in this current influx of Darug learning, 
you know, we have created this Biella Facebook, which has really, really exploded. And we're really seeing people really embrace that learning journey on there, which has been just incredible, you know, and, um, and starting to become inter interactional, you know, we're starting to get a little bit more communicative, but people are really starting to use the phrases that we've, that we've developed and um, they really want to communicate with each other. And, we're, and even around Sydney, if you're there, you'll probably start to see in many of the malls and um, the shopping centres that um, some of this signage is changing with the language now because many of our um, artists and are putting that into their artwork and it's beautiful to see all this language pop up all over Sydney, the language of place. So, um, you know, it, it really, it's... It's really quite extraordinary. I Yesterday I was walking through my school because I'm a primary school teacher and one of the preschool students yelled out to me, I haven't seen him all year, it's been six months, but he's in kindy now, and he screamed out to me, Budgery. He was trying to say hello, but this is the only thing he remembers from the year before. <laughs> <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> so uh, I just, yeah, it is, it, is what, it is just such a joy, yeah. Five minutes remaining. Thank you. Um, yeah, whoops, we'll have to wriggle along a little bit here. Um, so, um, yeah, we will wriggle now. Um, other languages, um, this is a huge, you know, sort of aspect of the Darug language ecology. Um, so, obviously, for Darug community members, as we said at the start, um, um, yeah, it's an English language ecology, you know, uh, in some cases, an Aboriginal um, English, but that's because of the time depth of, you know, being first colonised and being the earliest experiences of um, language contact and shift in Australia. Um, but we have a lot of other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, people, rather a large population, in fact, in, in um, Sydney, um, and they have language affili affiliations too, as well as a, you know, comparatively huge number of English only speakers, as well as really large numbers of immigrant languages. So this makes it quite a different language ecology to many say regional towns, for example. So if you just have a quick look at 2021, which we've put together for the Sydney Basin, you can see that we've got um, um, a number of uh, languages. Um, these were the largest um, um, number of uh, responses. And so Amaradjuri um, as the single name language had the highest and then Gamilaroi. But the thing is, just so that you know, is that Darug isn't on the Australian standard classification of languages, so that list. And so if you were to respond um, as a Darug speaker, wanting to claim that, then your answer would go under other Australian Indigenous languages, um, nowhere else classified. I think that's Jane and I looked at it and damn it, I've forgotten it already. Um, and here, um, just so that you can see um, is um, what I mean by, or what we mean by having these huge numbers of um, yeah, other speakers, including of English. People, um, Darug people in huge numbers wrote down that they were speaking Darug. And so they're very disappointed that it didn't pop up on the um, mm. ABS. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, there's a lot we could say about that counting, but I might move on, but if people yeah. want to ask questions, mm. hey, yeah. Um, so in terms of varieties, it's a little bit like what we said before with the naming um, and um, the, the grouping of, of languages, um, but, you know, by and large, how we're referring to Darug or the Sydney language is, um, yeah, one language with, you know, variation. And we have a beautiful study by Wilkinson Nash and Troy, who's here today, also, um, yeah, sort of says, you know, there's at least, you know, two dialects, so we know there's variation. In our work, what we try and do is, you know, we sort of just, we don't try and name any sort of this um, dialects uh, or variation at the moment we just try and sort of go by the speak if we know that the source the year the location again that can be a bit tricky understanding the location while we acknowledge um, for example um, Nash and Dawes Law so it's about the nasal um, dialect as we're calling it just to ourselves um, we acknowledge the variation so but we're not sort of doing um, lines on map and 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 there's very good reasons we hope we you know we sort of explaining to you um, because um, it is um, heart failure material and it changes really regularly and it's very difficult in the community to understand all of these reasons so this flipping through um, some of the approximate things that we've seen I don't know um, Jasmine or Corinne if you want to say anything on that yeah I, I said it before and it, it's yeah. just that every time somebody writes about us it changes and so that gets very distressing for us um, and so what can I say about that? Um, 
so you know so it was wonderful that the Darug people are, are starting to write about themselves yeah and it is really hard and one thing you guys said um once when we were looking at this is you know when we looked I think it was the war map and we looked at it and it was kind of like what do you think people would make of it and then both you and Karina said where is that line in, in relation to Sydney? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That's yeah. true because that's kind of like the, the orientation to sort of everyday community members to this kind of material. Hey, That's exactly right. Yeah. And for some reason, they get used against us constantly. Mm. So that's the other issue. Mm. Yeah. Which is to do with, you know, sort of the resources. You've got huge numbers yeah. of people piled into Sydney, as we've spoken about, and maybe we haven't yeah. teased that apart enough because we're going really fast, everybody. But anyhow, yeah. 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 Look, in terms of written traditions, quite obviously, um, alphabetic writing wasn't a traditional practice, and yet the Darug language exists because of written archival records, but they're not written by Darug speakers, and they're quite idiosyncratic in their spellings as well. And so there's really a huge potential for great community confusion. And so um, um, in Jasmine and Karina, your work, um, I think you've already said you how we're all on a language learning journey, um, mm -hmm. but you've, you've sort of shared the spelling, haven't you? You know, the way that you've been researching. Did you want to talk to We that? have, most definitely. Mm -hmm. And it, it, is, it has been wonderful for people to, um, to find out about it and to know why some things have changed and why they've been spelt that way. And we, we really talk about um, not getting Englished and, and saying that it's all about the sound, you know, because Darig sounds beautiful and we want to sound like that. And so, um, yeah, so, so, and also that we are all learners and even if people are using old spellings or old sounds, that's okay as well, you know, um, because we are all learning. But to have a standardised spelling system, we can already see how it is um, allowing the community to really speak together it's it's incredible so yeah it's very powerful ah institutional support a jolly topic um so unsurprisingly as everybody involved in language work in australia knows that um this is patchy and not very high and in sydney of course there's so many language interests as we tried to indicate when we're looking at the you know other languages in sydney um, and it can be a bit counterintuitive, actually, because if you read many policies and protocols, it sort of seems to indicate that a language of place, as in an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander language of place, might be um, the first language that might be considered in schools, etc. But that hasn't been necessarily the experience yeah. in Sydney. Um, and a lot of things, again, everybody who's in the audience will understand this, you know, so much stop-start work, it all revolves around grants and projects, yeah. and there's so little reliability and continuity. Um, but when we were thinking about it, we thought, well, schools, you know, university sector, and then we've got other institutions that you know, we have or hope to have support from. <laughs> yeah, it is very difficult to get a school program up without a language nest because mm. um, there's no money to actually back it. So you're allowed to have it, but um, there's actually no money to follow through on that. So that is really that is really hard for people in community who want to, to put a language um, course up. Mm. Yeah. And that's the New uh, South Wales context, so it's for people from other parts of yeah, Australia. Mm. Yeah. Time but, to yeah. So we're we're sort of running out of time. So we might just whiz through yep. if that's okay, everybody. Um, and so that we can have a bit of time for um, um, questions. Um, so in terms of speaker attitudes, um, you could just summarize as sort of keen, um, really yeah. keen with high numbers. A few concerns. Um, um, there's a bit of nervousness, um, particularly amongst adult language learners. And um, we have young students who, as Jasmine already, you know, sort of indicated, even the littlest of them just love learning Darug. Yeah. Absolutely love it. The kid, even today I was at a school and the kid children were coming up to me afterwards saying, I just really want to learn more. They're so keen to learn. It is, it is wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. And then in terms of overall status, you know, we have, you know, sort of, um, yeah, sort of huge positivity actually and potential, incredible amount of optimism. Lots of people see it as this incredibly important social act, um, but it is also individual, but has that potential to be. 
Um, and into the future, we see school and maybe uni and TAFE, you know, sort of driving a lot of this revival work or being you know, rather pivotal in it. Um, but also, um, Jasmine, I don't know if you want to talk about that potential career pathway because it's something very close to your heart. Yeah, it is. We would really like to see um, in Western Sydney a Year 12 um, TAFE course that allows them to get a pathway towards university or towards teaching as, an, um, as a school leaver. And we're working really hard to do that at the moment because, you know, I, I strongly believe that Aboriginal languages education really rolls on to so much employment for Aboriginal people because once you have that, then you need um, literature to be made. And to make great literature, you need, you know, content makers and writers and illustrators and it all rolls on. And as, you know, as we all know, nobody comes to Australia to stare at a pit in the ground. <laughs> We're coming to learn about wonderful um, Aboriginal culture and languages and so there is no reason why Aboriginal people cannot thrive in this industry. And we need to, you know, do everything we can to make that happen. And so in conclusion, what we hope we've sort of shown you is that um, in terms of, you know, this, um, the macro level, our framework is, you know, a bit useful for distinguishing these broad types of language ecologies. And it's kind of like a first step if we want to get, um, you know, policy makers and funding to sort of um, support first languages and um, support additional language learning um, in the ways that each context requires. But we think that there's different parameters operating in each language ecology, and that's really important as we hope we've illustrated to you. So we think that um, Howland's questions aren't a bad jumping off point, but there's a bit more to it. So in that sense, we agree with Ray, uh, Rob Amory um, in his um, appraisal of how important it was to think about the actual you know, particulars of the local mm -hmm. setting. Um, and so we hope that we've sort of given you a bit of indication of how we've been thinking about these extra considerations, but it is pretty early and we still got a lot to do on it. So thank you.